Thank you, Richard. I'm going to sit here because I'm by myself with people visiting. So hello, everybody. My name is Ted Janoulis, and welcome to Ocean Rise, which is uh, complementary in a sense and inspired by the poetry that you heard earlier. So we're putting those things together, looking for connections wherever we can. Um, our, first, our first panel that has to do with oceans um, for Glaxon, it's such a central part of things. Um, and we are starting with a bang. We are very fortunate to have ocean luminaries uh, joining us uh, remotely to come in and uh, spend time with us. These are people who are um, the best in the world at what they do, but they're also connected by this incredible bond of the oceans and are some of the most effective advocates, stewards, and operators in the oceans that we have today. So we're, we're thrilled to, ha to have them here. Um, we're going to take an extraordinary voyage. We're going to go to the outer edges of the solar system to look at ocean worlds. We're going to zoom back in, splash down, and go down into the, the, the amazing twilight zone uh, under the sea. Then we're going to come up, and technology allowing, we'll spend a, a few minutes on the uh, Ocean Explorer, the extraordinary new oceanic research vessel. So we have uh, a lot to do in this time, um, and we have great people to do it with. And uh, technology permitting, hopefully we're joined here, and I can see him, uh, Jim Cameron who, as they say, uh, needs no introduction, the National Geographic Explorer at large, filmmaker, and so many other things. Um, welcome, Jim, and thank you so much. We know it's late at night where you are now, and we so appreciate your joining us. Hi, Ted. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm down here in, in New Zealand working on the Avatar sequels, and it's uh, the end of a long production day for me, so I'm going to try to be somewhat coherent. <laughs> Fantastic. So I think we should start with um, some of your background pertaining to ocean exploration because you've really been at this ocean world's uh, idea for more than 20 years. Um, Aliens of the Deep, which you can see, uh, the audience can see to my left over here, came out in 2005. Um, you've also been on NASA's advisory board and co-chair of Caltech Space Innovation Council. So maybe we should start with what are ocean worlds and what did you chronicle in Aliens of the Deep? Well, we all know the closest ocean world, you know, we're standing on it, and it's two-thirds ocean, and I think we're all familiar with that, but I think it's, it's only in relatively recent years that we've, we've come to understand the solar system is filled with ocean worlds. Uh, we have uh, Europa being probably the most prominent one of scientific interest, which is at Jupiter. Uh, it's a large moon covered in ice. You've also got uh, uh, Ganymede and Callisto at Jupiter. Very interesting moon at Saturn called Enceladus that we now strongly believe has hydrothermal vent activity down there because they were able to fly a space probe through a, a plume that was venting out of the ice at, at Enceladus and find uh, uh, nano, uh, nano-sized silica uh, molecules which are only produced uh, that we know of in hydrothermal vents. So, you know, I was, I was making deep dives to the hydrothermal vents in the Atlantic and the Pacific back in 2003, 2004, and that led to the film that, that you mentioned. And I had this crazy idea to take space scientists with me. Hmm. It was a little bit counterintuitive, but we actually taught, uh, brought um, uh, Kevin Hand, who's now the head of Europa uh, Habitability Science, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. At the time, he was a fresh out PhD studying planetary science. Took him with us, took him down in a sub, and showed him hydrothermal vent activity, which he understood abstractly, but it really lit up his brain taking him down there and seeing it, uh, seeing it in progress. And he and I started realizing that the space community that he worked in and the ocean community that I was so you know deeply involved in um, weren't really talking to each other, that there were a lot of scientists that could have benefited from each other's, each other's knowledge. So a few years later, uh, because I, I was well-connected with Woods Hole and I was well-connected with JPL, we actually started to put together this program, which, which became Ocean Worlds. It's now, it's now the program is actually called Ocean Worlds. And it's gone from just a handful of scientists in both places, Kevin uh, at JPL and Chris German at, at, um, at Woods Hole. There are now 500 scientists involved in this program, split about evenly between between space science and, and ocean science. 
And they're looking at how we can understand our own world better as an avenue toward understanding what's happening on these ice moons out deep in our solar system, which could be places that, that harbor life. And the, and the capabilities that we create to explore in space and to explore these other worlds, we can use back here on Earth to understand our oceans better and protect them better. So it's a, it's a, if we thought of it as a way of sort of jointly funding the development of capability. And this was our dream back then, I want to say nine, ten years ago, and it's actually coming to fruition now. So many people are getting enthused and excited about this kind of cross-pollination between, between space and ocean science. Mm -hmm. And people can see on, on my right um, some of these uh, ocean moons, and they can also see, uh, I think they're rotating through some of the other images of these extraordinary vehicles, which are not in the imagination anymore, but actually being assembled. So maybe to take up on that, you've been a, a tech innovator all your life, and uh, I've seen your, your uh, drawings of your, your, your underwater habitat when you were 14 years old, calling up <laughs> Dr. Joe McGinnis to say, what do you think of this structure? Um, and by the way, that, that same giving back that Joe has done, um, you have done in so many ways as well. Um, so you've innovated for the oceans and space. Um, what is it about the technical advances? Maybe a little bit more on how it is that they enable um, this kind of pursuit. It's just great that you mentioned Joe McGinnis because he was a pioneer in, in Canada back in the 70s and 80s in living and working underneath the, uh, the ice, working underwater. Uh, he's an amazing guy. Good, he's a good friend of mine. But in terms of the, the, the tech innovation, you know, it's going to require some pretty advanced technologies to get onto the surface of these, these ice moons and sample them and look for life there. And it turns out that a lot of it is very similar to things we've been developing in the last, the last few years. For example, the hadal depth landers and submersibles and remotely operated vehicles that are going down to the deepest trenches on the planet have to be built to withstand exactly the same type of pressure regime that might exist um, at the bottom of the ocean on Europa. Now, so, so why are we so interested in this ocean on Europa? Well, Europa is a moon that's covered in ice, and the ice might be up to seven miles thick, and the water under it is a brine. We know that because that brine is coming out onto the surface of Europa. And Kevin Hand, whom I mentioned earlier, was able to prove spectroscopically that it's actually sodium chloride. Um, and it's discolored by the, all the radiation coming from Jupiter. So sodium chloride, that means a salty ocean, like what we have here. And we strongly believe that there could be hydrothermal activity there. And we know that hydrothermal vents here on Earth, which were only discovered relatively recently in the, in the mid-70s by Dr. Robert Ballard and some others, um, they are an oasis for life in the, in the deep ocean. And they, it's actually life that lives off the chemical interactions of, the, of, of geology and water. And so you have an energy source, you have chemical food and energy for these, these animals, and you've got a bacterial community, and then other higher life forms live on top of that. Could something be, be going on like that at Europa or at Enceladus or some of these other ice moons? It's an amazing possibility. And I think that the vast majority, well, I don't say the vast majority, but certainly a majority of astrobiologists today believe that we're more likely to find extant life on Europa or Enceladus or, or an ice moon in our solar system than on Mars, where we're spending so much time and energy exploring. And I love Mars. Don't get me wrong. It's not, a, it's not an either or. It's a, it's a yes and. Let's, let's do them both. But if we're going to find life, it's probably going to be on Europa. Interesting, too, because so much of the press focuses uh, life from way beyond, and from other galaxies and way beyond where we are. But what's actually happening, what you're referring to, is it's happening right now with real machines and real yep. people and real collaboration. Is that collaboration, it feels like that's a like that NASA-like feeling of large projects that have to last. You, that program that you're referring to with Woods Hole um, and, and NOAA has been a long time in the making and still has a, quite a trajectory in front of it. Oh, absolutely. Look, it's going to take, it's going to take decades. And, but it's starting to get incorporated into the, into the, the sort of decadal conversation of what we should be doing in terms of our space missions. There's already a Europa Clipper 
that's heading out, and that'll be at Europa in a few years, and it can pick out landing sites and learn more about the surface. Uh, there was a Europa lander being designed at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. The funding for that was was uh, was cut off just due to politics, but it'll come back. And uh, people just need to to lean into this. And where where we can work in the meantime is right here on Earth. We can build uh, very small vehicles because we're going to need to send very small vehicles out to the the outer solar system, and we really need those here in Earth's oceans. What we need is swarms of thousands of robotic vehicles that that are very miniaturized, that have their own onboard smarts, that can function together or independently, that can function independently of humans. We need to to apply AI technology to this, because you know you were talking. I mean. Uh, um, we're talking about Earth from orbit, and it's like, yeah, of course, we can put up weather satellites. We can, we can get almost instantaneous data about what's happening in the atmosphere, but it takes years to understand what's happening in the ocean and the changes that are happening in the ocean uh, take a lot of time samples over a long time to really build up a picture. We don't have that same I idea of just being able to get an instantaneous view of the, of the atmosphere, of the, of the weather. So we need to put big swarms of robotics out there to do that, to get some, we'll never be quite as real time as, as, we, as we can see from orbit, but we can start getting a better near time picture of what's happening and we can understand the changes due to climate change. We can understand the carbon cycle and what's happening with, with heat and uh, how carbon's being absorbed and how ocean currents might be changing um, as the climate changes, these are, this is information we need. And some of the, the, the technology is common to both going out into the outer solar system and going into the deep ocean and, and these robotic systems.